Um, thank you everyone for joining us this morning for bid training. Uh, we're running this in collaboration with Canterbury City Council who are co-funding the session. Um, because of that funding, we've actually been able to extend the offer over to both Whitstable and Herne Bay. And I know we've got businesses joining us from both of those places as well. So a big warm welcome from us all. Um, today, we are focusing on HR and we have fantastic Catherine Dorr from Bracious, who's a partner and employ employment specialist. So thank you very much, Catherine, for providing us with this session today. Um, Catherine's got a, a 40 minute presentation. She's happy to take questions as we go through. Because this is in webinar format, um, if you have any questions as we go, please put them in the chat and we will, uh, I can read them out to Catherine, it's no problem. And at the end, if there are further details you'd like to explore, um, we can unmute you, obviously, and have um, more of a conversation around it. Um, so without further ado, uh, a warm welcome to Catherine. Thank you so much for doing this for us today. It's over to you. Thank you very much, Rachel. Lovely to see, well, sort of virtually see everybody. Um, as Rachel has said, I am Catherine Dorr. I'm a partner at Bracious, uh, Bracious Solicitors, and we are based in Canterbury and Maidstone. Um, and we're going to do a hot topic session this morning on employment law developments. I absolutely have not called it hot topics in order to try and make it sound a little bit more exciting than it is. Absolutely, it was not a shameless attempt to make employment law seem more exciting than it is. Um, we're going to go through um, a number of upcoming changes. Uh, this is a big year for employment law and HR changes. Um, and there are some quite fundamental practical differences um, that you will need to be aware of and that are coming up again. Absolutely not because it is an election year that we've had changes. We've had a very quiet few years, not a lot going on from an employment law point of view. In this election year, we have got some very significant differences in the way that we have been um, doing things. As I say, that will that does have practical implications, some of them starting from April, so, so quite soon, some of them um, already in. The intention of this session um, is to give you an overview in 40 minutes, you'll appreciate. We can't cover everything, so it's just intended to be a heads up, key points. I've included some slides that give a little bit more detail on particular areas, especially holiday pay. Um, when we get to the holiday pay section, I will take an absolute deep breath. And so will you, because it is phenomenally complicated. Um, all of these changes are badged under the heading of um, making things easier for businesses, streamlining, removing red tape. I can guarantee you will not feel like that by the end of this session. Maybe I shouldn't have said that right at the start and <laughs> make you feel worse. Absolutely, it's so much simpler than it was before, um, but particularly holiday pay is really complicated. Even we in employment law, uh, uh, as employment lawyers, are um, looking at it and in places scratching our heads. Um, so with that, uh, we will get going. You can see from the slide um, the topics that we're going to cover today. So these are all new changes. We're not going to look at case law. We're going to look at the hot topics, i.e. the things that are coming up. Um, so there are a number under the flexible work heading, so particularly flexible work requests, a really quite radical new arrangement, the right to request pr predictable working conditions, some changes to pregnancy and maternity, carers leave, neonatal, um, a nice little piece on tips, and then oh, deep breath, holiday pay. Uh, which is which is the biggie, and I suspect that's where we're going to be um, spending most of our time. Um, Rachel has very kindly said that she's going to keep an eye on the chat, and if there are questions that you've got, um, then raise them. Rachel is going to interject, and I'm happy to take questions as we go. We're hoping that there'll be some time at the end for any um, remaining questions, but do do ask as you go, unless it's again, holiday pay, in which case uh, our internet might go down and I might not be available to answer questions on those points, but you know, we'll see how we go. Um, so moving on to our first our first topic, flexible work, whoop whoop. Um, it's anticipated to come in this year, so probably uh, the summer. You'll be familiar with the current arrangements for asking for flexible work arrangements, so for part-time work and condensed hours, all those sorts of things covered by the existing arrangements. Um, there's a fairly loose structure that we have now, um, so employees have the right to, to make flexible work requests 
it's one request in 12 months. They need to set out um, what they want, how they think it will impact on their employer, the changes that, uh, that, that they would like to be made. Employers have an obligation to think about that reasonably and to make a decision within three months. So there's a, there's a framework there, but it's a reasonably loose framework. Um, we have seen a very large increase in the number of flexible work requests that are being made. Um, we saw it increasing up to the pandemic and post pandemic. Absolutely. Um, we've seen it um, increase even further um, with um, quite a lot of employees. Um, I'm going to say rightly or wrongly, um, but from a legal point of view, wrongly thinking that they have the right to request the, the right to have as opposed to the right to request particular work arrangements, including home working in some in pockets. We've seen quite resist quite a lot of resistance to individuals coming back into the workplace. So those types of requests are covered under these arrangements. Um, new changes, as you can see there. Uh, so employees will no longer, when they make their request, have to say what the effect on their employers would be. I think that's a, a good and practical change because quite honestly, employees don't know what the impact on their employer is going to be and, and people struggled with it. It was a little bit meaningless made no difference so that's gone um, they will now be able to make two requests in any 12 month period there is a positive obligation to consult so rather than just have a meeting positive obligation to explore with individuals what that flexible work um, arrangement looks like and you will need to make a decision within two months what hasn't changed is that this isn't a right to have a flexible work arrangement. It's still a right to request flexible working. Um, and you can see that there is an ACAS, as you know, ACAS is the conciliation service that have lots of lovely guidance um, on a variety of um, employment situations. And some of them are statutory codes. So I, they are looked at when courts or tribunals are considering particular issues. Um, so uh, ACAS is going to launch a, an updated statutory code on flexible work requests. Um, and it will give you more detail on how to handle it, some good practice guidance, um, and it will also cover the reasons um, on the basis of which you can reject a request. So those are things like um, the impact on colleagues, the impact on efficiency, um, problems with, uh, with um, productivity, all those sorts of good business reasons, they are still there um, and you will still be able to refer to them um, if you can't accommodate somebody's flexible work request um, and, and you need to either think of something else or unfortunately decline the request. So moving on, what I, what I badged as very exciting, uh, the right to request predictable terms. This is really new, very exciting. Um, anticipated to come into place in September. And that will give workers um, and, age, and individuals working by agencies the right to request more predictable terms and conditions of work. So if they're working a very variable um, pattern, if they are on certain types of fixed term contracts, they will be able to ask for a more predictable um, work pattern. You can see there are some minimum service requirements, um, so a minimum service of uh, 26 weeks. The process will be similar to what we've just talked about. So um, a request will be made, an obligation, there will be an obligation to consider that um, and to consult with the individual. But this is something that we have not had before, that right to request predictable um, terms. The reason I've included it as a top, hot topic is because obviously it's new, but also again, post pandemic, we have seen um, a very large increase in uh, in employers organizations using different employment models so there is an emphasis on flexibility I think we all want to be a little bit more agile than we were before we potentially want to be a bit more conservative so we have seen um, an increase in um, the use of agency workers zero hours contracts um, all sorts of flexible work arrangements that benefit both employers and employees um, and it's probably out of that has come this proposal for um, uh, for individuals to be able to request more predictable terms. Um, I think it will be interesting how this plays out. Say so it's not a right that we've we've had before. Um, and it sort of, in some ways, potentially undermines the, the reason why we have these flexible work arrangements so that they are flexible, agile, etc. But as I say, we'll we'll see how it we'll see how it comes out. As I say, 
if you receive this type of request, then um, you have to look at it in a reasonable way. You have to notify the outcome of the decision and um, the grounds that I've set out. So some of those that we've just talked about in relation to flexible work can form the basis of a, of a refusal of a request for predictable work patterns. So as you can see, burden of additional cost, detrimental impact on customer demand. Again, all those good business reasons um, that might justify a refusal. And again, we've got an ACAS code of practice that you might want to have a look at. Well, you will want to have a look at if you get one of these requests. I'm not anticipating there will be a huge increase. Well, we've not had it before, so <laughs> it is going to be an increase. But I'm not going to, I'm not anticipating we'll have a huge number of requests. But I wanted to flag up that this is a new rights coming in, I say, not until the summer, uh, that uh, you need to be aware of. Moving on to pregnancy and maternity, again, just a shameless means of grabbing your attention. That picture makes me smile every single time. It's just a random baby, but it's very cute. Um, so we've got some changes relating to pregnancy and maternity, not a significant change from where we are now. Um, so we don't quite know, uh, we don't have the exact date for implementation, um, but what we do know are the, the key provisions for this, um, new, uh, this new legislation. You're probably aware that women on maternity leave have enhanced rights when we're looking at um, things like redundancy. So redundancy in particular, it's an example of positive discrimination yeah, to support women on maternity leave. So current arrangement is um, women on maternity leave who are made redundant have a right to be offered suitable alternative employment where it exists. So that means they have priority over everybody else. Um, that doesn't mean they can't be made redundant, but it means that if there is a role that's suitable for them, they need to be offered that role. Um, and this legislation is going to extend that. So we're now um, looking at um, pregnant women, so extending the time period beyond maternity leave, we're looking at new parents, we're looking at um, those on adoption leave and on shared parental leave, which you know makes us go slightly cold, and not because it's not a good thing, but because shared parental leave regulations are phenomenally complicated. Those of you who have to deal with it in practice, it really are, it's very fiddly. Um, and you can see, as it says from the slide, that we've got an extended right to be offered suitable alternative employment where there is a vacancy. So you're not obliged to create one um, from notification of pregnancy up to 18 months after a baby is born. Um, and you can see the reference to the current position. So again, it's just a flag to say that if you're looking at um, if you're looking at changes um, needing to be made within your organisation, and that potentially covers um, pregnant women, those on maternity leave, and um, individuals on other types of uh, of the types of leave, you need to have a little look and make sure that you are complying with your observation uh, obligations. We have. Other additional changes to um, carers leave um, and to, um, we're going to come on to neonatal leave. I don't think I put another cute picture of a baby, but I might have done. So, you know, look, look out if it's there. Um, but this, this uh, change is to do with carers. You will have seen in the press the um, impact that caring obligations have on a lot of people, um, obviously, People my age, we talk about the squeeze generation, don't we? I've got children who are in their late teens, early 20s, and elderly parents at the other end. So you're, you're coming in the middle with two sets of um, caring obligations. Um, and this uh, legislation acknowledges that. So we're anticipating it will come into force reasonably soon. Um, and it introduces an entitlement, as you can see, to one week's unpaid leave a year um, for the purposes of providing care for a dependent or someone with a long term need. And when we're talking about a dependent, we're talking about immediate a close family members. And we've also we're also talking about people who reasonably rely on an individual for the purposes of their care. So it could be, you know, a very close friend or somebody who for whom um, care is being provided um, and we can have leave in half days, full days, block of a week. Um, and this right comes in. You've seen that some of the rights we've talked about have a service requirement um, and some of them you know, will, will come in from the start of employment. And this is a this is a start of employment right. I've given you a little bit more detail there so to, to flesh out that, as I say, the arrangements are there. 
um, to enable individuals to uh, make arrangements for care. It might include things like helping with official or financial matters. So those of us who've got powers of attorney might include that type of thing, personal or medical care. So it's quite a wide ranging right and really underpins um, the government's stated commitment to acknowledge um, the uh, contribution that carers play within our organisation and intended to support. Um, I, I'm sure we can, I'm sure we all support it. Um, it is one of those rights that I think um, will be used a lot and some employers may feel that that is um, placing a, an additional burden on employers um, when it should be the state who takes such responsibility. We're, we're not going to win those arguments. The, the, new, the new right is coming in, as I say, I'm, I'm sure we're all supportive of the intention um, that carers do need uh, additional support and it can be very difficult to balance those um, outside obligations with your work obligations. Oh, I have got a cute picture of a baby. There you go. There's another one, just to wake you up again. Um, again, a new right coming in, um, not, not uh, anticipated to be implemented too soon, um, but covers uh, neonatal care. So there is a right for up to 12 weeks paid leave for parents of babies, um, parents of babies rather, who need uh, neonatal care. And I've set out the basic requirements there. So again, it's it's a heads up that some new rights are coming. Um, and all of these rights that we've talked about, I'm flagging them to you, one, because you need to be aware, and two, because now is the time that you probably need to be changing your, um, your policies and procedures, your employee handbooks, if you haven't done it already, um, you probably need to be doing that in advance. And we're certainly doing a lot of work for clients at the moment to make sure that their handbooks are um, up to date uh, and their arrangements anticipate these new changes so that everybody is um, familiar with, with, the, uh, with the new provisions. Um, I hesitate to ask because these are quite set, quite sensitive issues. But if you've got any questions, then say Rachel will happily pick them up. We're going to move on to tips. Um, so this is the last bit on um, on families and general leave requirements. If anything occurs to you now or at the end, then do shout. And I'm going to say I'm happy to answer questions. Uh, it's a lot of this stuff. We're kind of guessing. We can see what's in the regulations, but until it's properly implemented, we won't really know the full scale of it. Um, so unless there are any questions, I will move on to tips. Obviously, I appreciate relevant for some of you. So I could see from the attendee list that we've got some um, hospitality um, businesses attending. So this relevant for you, but I appreciate a bit less relevant for some of the others of you. Uh, so expected to come into force fairly soon. Um, and it places a positive duty on employers um, to ensure that tips are fairly allocated. So it doesn't necessarily mean that they have to be divided by total number of people, but fairly allocated, um, including agency workers, um, between uh, individuals working, and there are provisions around timing. So as you can see that it needs to be paid in full, no later than the end of the month in which the qualifying tip was paid by the customer. Um, and you have a choice, you can either do that yourself, which I suspect is what most people will do. Certainly the, the indication from our clients is they're intending to do that. Or you can use an independent operator. So you can use an independent scheme that will automatically allocate based on the, uh, the arrangements, the methodology that you put in place. Um, and that will do that for you. You need to have a written policy. So again, I'm flagging it to you because um, there needs to be a written policy in place and you need to keep a record. Um, so some fairly basic things, but it is a change from, from the very loose arrangements that we've had so far. Moving on to sexual harassment. Um, so this is obviously both a very important issue and also um, places some um, again, more positive duties on employers. You will see coming through all of these topics that we've talked about, um, and as I alluded to at the start, you may not feel that um, all of these changes are making your life easier because there are quite a few additional obligations that are now being placed on employers, and this is another one. Um, so currently, individuals can obviously bring an employment tribunal claim if they feel that they have been harassed by a colleague. Um, and there is what we call a statutory defence. So an employer can defend that claim, even if it, even if 
the um, actions have happened, they can defend it by saying, well, we did everything we could to stop it. So we had appropriate training in place. We've got a policy. We reacted appropriately once it was reported to us. Um, and this new legislation is similar to that, but it takes it a little step further. Um, so um, it will now mean that an employer has to, uh, is under an obligation to take reasonable steps Previously, in earlier drafts, it was all steps. So now it's been watered down a little bit. Um, the employer has to take reasonable steps to prevent sexual harassment in the workplace of its employees in the course of their employee uh, in the course of their employment. Um, and if you don't do that, not only will you potentially face an employment tribunal claim, um, but there is the possibility of compensation being uplifted um, where you're not seen to have done everything you reasonably can. So for practical purposes, um, you obviously need um, training, not just at induction. So um, most organisations are pretty good um, on initial induction, initial appointment. Um, there will be some reference to um, obligations around preventing discrimination and treating colleagues with respect. Um, but a, a lot of organisations don't necessarily have a regular reminder. The ideal is to have say an annual training session, whether that's a meeting with your teams, whether that's some sort of online training, but something, something that you can point to that says this is um, regularly updated um, and you obviously need to keep a record of attendees. So signature sheets of training, electronic records, something that shows you've done it. You need to keep your policies and procedures up to date um, and have a good, strong quality statement. Again, handbook might need to be reviewed if you haven't reviewed it for a while. Um, not that the principles have changed, but it, it's worth um, having a look at it. Um, and you obviously need to know what you're going to do if you um, if uh, you face allegations like this, you need to need to you will know, we'll need to have a plan in place, what you're going to do, how you're going to support, how you're going to respond, et cetera, et cetera. So it's slightly upping your obligations from where they were before. Catherine, sorry, mm. before you move on, um, we have had a question come mm. in and it's regarding tips. Okay. Um, so this is from Julie Dodd, who's actually opening a, a new cafe. It's the okay. CIC on Castle Street. She's written, we intend to have volunteers helping in the cafe. Okay. Is there a rule for tip allocation for this? Does giving tips to volunteers give them employment rights or muddy the waters? Thank you. Oh, interesting question. Yeah, so two two issues there. Um, yes, do, do you have to allocate the tips and does it create an employment arrangement? If I deal with it in the reverse, um, employment status is determined on the basis of a number of tests and um, so they go in and out of fashion so I am obviously very old and um, I qualified 25 years ago and when I qualified we were concerned about we you know we talked about the master and servant relationship we'd have talked about the level of control that an organization has over what somebody does and that was a key factor in determining employment status it's a little bit out of fashion now so what we now talk about is mutuality of obligation that's our top test um, and um, the right of substitute so an employment arrangement cannot exist unless there is an obligation on an employer to provide work and an individual to do that work. And obviously there is a pay arrangement involved. So a volunteer, by its nature, they will they will not have well one they're not going to be paid in the normal way, and two they won't have that obligation to turn up. If a volunteer doesn't want to turn up, although it's inconvenient if they don't, they don't have to because that's the nature of being a volunteer. Um, payment of tips, I can't see that that is likely to change that arrangement. They'll still be, even though they'll be getting a little bit of um, payment, you'll be potentially distributing um, the, uh, the, the, tip that's, uh, the tip that's given. Um, that is not the same as being paid for the work that's done, and it wouldn't change that mutuality of obligation issue. Somebody could still say, I don't want to turn up tomorrow. I've got something on. I'm not going to come in. Um, second issue, are you obliged to um, to distribute the tips? Again, it's, an, it's a new right, so we're not fully up to speed as to how it will work in practice. Um, I don't see that you are, um, but I, so far as you can, for practical purposes, I think you need to make a distinction between tips that are left that are a contribution to the CIC. Because if somebody wants to support the organisation, they want to make a donation, that's obviously not the same thing as a tip. But if it's a, a tip that's clearly left for the individual who's provided the service, I suspect that 
at some point that will come within these types of arrangements because individuals not employees they wouldn't be workers in workers in this situation but i suspect they might well be covered um so i suppose i've got two two opinions on it one so far as you can try and be clear whether uh, it's a it's a donation made to the organization or whether it's a tip for the individual if it's a tip for the individual then i would suggest you do have a policy in place so you do have give some thought to it in advance um, as to how you're going to deal with it and how uh, and whether they're going to be distributed and and if they are distributed then then how you're going to apply that i would be less concerned about that creating an employment relationship because i don't see that the other elements are there so I hope, that's, hope that <laughs> answers you. your question. It's a, it's a little bit of a guess at the moment because, as I say, we, we, we don't know how these things are going to work. Um, the beauty of employment law is that it's really fluid. Those of us who are employment lawyers, we really like it because it's always changing. It's always exciting. People do weird stuff at work. That is another reason why we love our jobs, because they just they just do. I don't, I don't know what happens when people, some people walk through the doors of their employer that all common sense goes out the window. But, um, but it does mean that, things are subject to quite a lot of change um we're obviously going to come on to talk about holiday pay those of you who had to grapple with holiday pay over the last five to ten years will have seen how much it's changed and and um this well i say all legislation will be subject to some adaptation as it goes through the courts and tribunals Right. Oh, sorry. Uh, sorry. Just one final bit from mm. Julie. Thank you. Great answer. I love the idea of donations for the CIC paying forward to provide free, free food for the vulnerable. So great. Thank you very much, Catherine. Fabulous. Good. I glad that was helpful. Um, as I say, this is where I take a deep breath and go holiday. <laughs> Again, this is under the heading of the intention is to make everything simpler. So as you will appreciate, our holiday pay rules up to now have come from European legislation. Um, the government decided that it wanted to move away from um, the European model, simplify everything to strip out some of the anomalies that come through um, European court decisions and have been fed down into our, uh, our local our national implementation. You will have to decide whether you think that these changes have made things simpler. I'm going with, really not. but you know, we'll give it a we'll give it a whirl. Um, I have summarised on this slide uh, the key changes to, to give you a sort of roadmap of the some of the things we're going to talk about as we go through the next slides. Um, I've included some that I'm going to talk about and some with red headings. The red headings, they will hurt your eyes, I'll be honest, but they are a red heading for me to go, don't talk about this because it's too complicated. But what I've wanted to do is give you a bit more information so that if you want to read into it a little bit more, then there is some more resource avail available for you. But it, there is a lot of technical detail um, and I don't want to um, bore you to tears <laughs> with stuff that you might not need. Um, so, as I say, the key rights are set out on this slide. So we've got changes to how we work out um, what people should be paid when they're on holiday. Um, and that uh, just brings into a legislative form some of our case law um, decisions. So this is already in place, uh, but uh, it's going it, it brings it into the legislation. Um, we've got new arrangements for rolled up holiday pay, which in my view are generally a good thing. We have been telling people for years that you can't pay rolled up holiday pay, that that's not possible. It's in general terms not lawful. Now we've got it. Um, we've got new ways of calculating that pay. There are new rules or extended rules on carrier over of holiday. So are you carrying over holiday from one year to the next and some changes about record keeping, which I'm not going to cover, but in general terms, it slightly loosens your record keeping obligations, particularly when looking at um, uh, recording the number of hours that people work. So if you, if you want some more information about that, um, uh, you can either you can follow us on LinkedIn and, and we've got some updates via LinkedIn or you can go to our Bracious website and there's some more guidance on that. So our first changes, um, I'm not going to go through the detail on the slide, I'm going to give you the short version. So in general terms, what the case law says and what the legislation now tells us we need to do is to include um, in holiday pay, the things that are normally paid to individuals, 
the basic rule of thumb is that when individuals are on holiday, they shouldn't receive less than they do when they're at work. Um, some of the case laws in case law in this area has looked at commission payments. And um, so obviously when people are out of work on holiday, they're not working and therefore they're not earning commission in the same way. Um, it looks at overtime payments. You'll have to lot of cases on overtime payments um, and whether those should be included. The new rules say yes, those regular payments, those things that people normally get when they're at work should be included in the calculation of holiday pay. And in some instances, for example, for individuals who receive commission payments, um, that can mean that they actually get paid more when they're on holiday than they do when they're not, because they get the sort of commission that they've already earned, that's paid, and then they also get a sort of notional amount um, yeah, to compensate them for the fact that they're not actually earning commission when they're away from work. So this is a change in the sense that it's introduced into legislation, but it's not a change in the law. Employers have already have an obligation to include overtime, certain types of commission payments, etc., in their calculation of holiday pay. So hopefully that is not that is not news to you. Um, what is new, as I say, is this rolled up holiday right and a rolled up holiday pay arrangement is one whereby an individual's hourly rate includes an element for holiday pay. So when um, paid the right to paid holiday first came in, lots of employers said, ah, but our hourly rate already includes a right in respect of holiday. Um, and fairly quickly, the court said no that's not right. An hourly rate is an hourly rate and you shouldn't be just saying it already includes a bit for holiday. There were certain circumstances in which it sort of could be done, but in general terms, um, you couldn't pay rolled up holiday. The new legislation um, means that we can now do it. We'll come on to when this is implemented in a minute, but um, it, it says we can now do it and we can do it for part year workers um, and people working irregular hours. The first question is, what do those two things mean? So an irregular hours worker, as you can see, so 1A on that slide um, gives you the definition. So we're talking about somebody who most of the time or all of the time and um, their hours vary. We don't really know what that means. We don't know what mostly means. Is it a percentage thing, more than 50 percent? Is it um, more than 60 percent or 70 percent? But as a general rule of thumb, it's somebody who most of the time um, uh, does a different number of hours and is paid for a different number of hours will be somebody who counts as an irregular hours worker. Um, and then the second definition, um, part year workers, we're talking about seasonal workers, we're talking about those who work term time only. And um, so you will have seen one of the big cases, Brazil was um, a uh, was somebody working in a school who worked term time only. So it covers that definition. And for those two types of individuals, so somebody who works different hours or somebody who only works for part of the year and is not paid for part of the year. So it's both. They don't work the whole year and um, and they don't get paid for the, the whole year. So it wouldn't cover your teachers who work, have you know periods of holiday, um, but are paid during those periods of holiday. We're talking about people who don't get paid when they're not working. Um, then we can um, talk well, then we can use a methodology that I'm coming on to which is to add on 12.07 percent to their hourly rate um, and um, if if they've got more than one type of contract with you we look at um, their work as a whole and we apply a simple methodology are you already feeling that this is making things much simpler you're already feeling reassured that it's so straightforward absolutely fine um, so as I say, for those two types of people, flexible workers and those who work part year, as I say, we can add on 12.07%. And that means that those individuals do not get paid holiday pay when they take holiday pay. When, when they take holiday, what they receive is that extra uplift each time they work. So sort of they're getting paid their holiday in advance um, and they don't get paid then when they take holiday. That still means that they have the right to take holiday. Um, but they're paid in a slightly different way. As I say, this is a red one. So a bit more detail for you, but I'm not going to go through it because I'll lose you. <laughs> it's really complicated. Now, in relation to those two types of workers, the flexible, uh, the uh, uh, irregular hours workers and our part year workers, we can either, we can choose to do one of two things. So we can choose to carry on as we have been, that when, one of those types of employees takes holiday, we calculate their holiday pay at the time they take their leave and they get paid that amount when they take their leave, or we can decide to do the 12.07%. Um, so they get paid when they work, 
don't get paid when they when they are on holiday um so it's it, it's slightly um I think rolled up holiday pay is helpful and it will definitely be helpful for um, your zero hours workers, for um, people working in hospitality that um, have a very seasonal workforce. Um, we do quite a lot of um, public sector work and we have bank workers who um, work in our hospitals um, and they I think it will be helpful for, for those very variable um, work patterns where it was phenomenally complicated to work out how much leave people should have. I think this rolled up holiday pay arrangement really will be very helpful. Um, but it, it does add, add a layer of complexity, both because you can choose um, and also because there are slightly different rules on record keeping and how you do it. But again, it's a flag for you to say that it's that it's there. The from when is a question that we're being asked a lot at the moment. Um, so the majority of holiday pay, pay changes that we're talking about do not start until after the 1st of April. And they apply to holiday years that start on or after the 1st of April. So a lot of our clients have a calendar year holiday year. So a 1st of Jan to the 31st of December holiday year. For them, they do not need to apply these new rules until the start of the 2025 holiday year. For those of you who have a 1st of April holiday year or one that starts after that, you are going to need to apply them. You, you'll need to get up to speed faster. People with calendar years have a little bit of time to get to grips with things before they actually have to change their arrangement. The exception to that are the rights that are already there. So we were, we've talked about um, how you calculate holiday pay uh, based on overtime and commission and that sort of thing. That's already a right based on case law. So that's already in. Doesn't really, it doesn't change under these rules substantially. But the um, arrangements around um, rolled up holiday pay, et cetera, do not have to come in, do not have to be applied um, for holiday years uh, unless they start on or after the 1st of April. Um, so hopefully that is a helpful um, indication. Um, and the last main issue that I wanted to talk about are the changes to carryover rules. So you're probably aware that individuals who've not been able to take all their leave because they're on some form of statutory leave, maternity leave, et cetera, or because they've been ill and therefore have not been able to take all their leave during the holiday year, case law says you can carry that over into the next holiday year. Most of your holiday policies probably say we only allow you to carry over a certain number of days, or they say we don't allow you to carry over any days, but there will be exceptions where um, there are these two types of leave, uh, th those, those two particular scenarios. We've now got, um, my colleague this morning said, um, that we've gone from one carryover period, i.e. you could carry over into the following year, to four different carryover periods, and that really makes things much more straightforward. Um, so what we've got now is uh, a requirement for employers to allow individuals to carry over any unused holiday into uh, the new holiday year and sometimes beyond that, and the period of carryover depends on the type of leave. So the first carryover period we've got is statutory leave. So if I've been on maternity leave and therefore I haven't been able to take all my accrued holiday, then I can carry that over and take it into the following year. That's probably straightforward. Most people will have a discussion with individuals going on maternity leave to say, when do you want to take your holiday before you go or when you come back? So that's probably not a significant change. Where someone's on sick leave, so I'm sick and therefore I haven't been able to take all my leave, I now have 18 months um, for, from the end of the leave year in which my entitlement arose. So I've got quite a long period of time to take that leave and that is very new um, and will need to be monitored. And then this one, this one is a biggie. Um, where an employer doesn't um, recognise someone's right to annual leave, doesn't give me a reasonable opportunity to take my leave or doesn't encourage me to do so. And I put that both in blue and in bold. And because that is, for most people, a really significant change, not necessarily based on the legislation, but it is something that's quite new. Um, and if I, if I haven't been told that if I don't take my leave, then I will lose it, um, then I have a very long period of um, carryover potentially indefinitely. Um, so the, the key things that I want you to take away from this holiday pay session are one, the implementation date, so on or after the 1st of April. Um, two, make sure your 
calculating your holiday pay correctly to include overtime, etc. Um, three, new arrangements for flexible work, but for this one, both in terms of carryover and your positive obligation. The new legislation emphasises very strongly that employers have a duty to make sure that individuals are encouraged to take their leave, that they're told how much leave is outstanding and they're told that sufficiently far in advance to enable them to take it. Up until now, I and my colleagues would have probably said, if you've got a policy and if you've got a contract that says this is your leave and if individuals can get access to their holiday records, that's probably enough. The suggestion now is that that is not going to be enough. As an employer, you need to do far more. So yes, you need a policy. Yes, you need to set out your holiday arrangements in a contract. Yes, individuals need to be able to access their um, the, you know, the amount of leave that's accrued. But you need to positively tell them and be able to prove that you've positively told them how much leave is owing sufficiently far in advance of the end of the holiday year to enable them to take it and they've been specifically warned that if they don't take it in time they will have um, they will lose it uh, and that you can do that as an automated thing you can do it as um, a specific bespoke email but you need to do you need to do a something to proactively tell them so that concludes both the holiday pay session and um, and their presentation say sure you're all feeling really assured reassured that it's so much simpler in the new world in the new world that everything is going to be much more streamlined and it's going to make your life a lot easier particularly in relation to holiday pay it's giving us a headache and we deal with this day in day out so i i am sympathetic that holiday pay rules are not easy um but hopefully uh hopefully i've given you a heads up what to do and a little bit of a practical pointer about the way you know, where you need to go with certain things um, Rachel, are there any more questions before we conclude? Before I've, everybody goes, oh, just pack I've been up and go home. An eye. <laughs> I've been keeping an eye. Nothing has come through on the Q and A. Um, that was incredibly helpful. Thank you so much. Um, that my takeaway so far is people do weird stuff at work. I like that as a <laughs> reason to keep it's you. A lot. There's keep a one reason I am an employment lawyer is because every week we get a something and we go, oh my gosh, <laughs> what were you thinking? <laughs> just love it sometimes we get photos sometimes we get film footage it's like oh gosh what what were you thinking yes the joy of our job is that that people are interesting fantastic well um yeah no q a so um i'm assuming that oh something's just popped up here we go if it's holiday um, pay my internet is going down any minute now. <laughs> it's from julie um, we Thank have a you. question, uh, but can we ask afterwards, please? Of course, that's that's absolutely fine. Um, I think probably the best thing, Julie, is that if you um, if you want to stay on on the call, we could continue if that's okay, Catherine. Mm -hmm. And we can we can release everybody else. <laughs> and uh, I, just on behalf of uh, Canterbury Bid and on behalf of Canterbury City Council as well, huge thank you to Catherine for your time today. Really, really appreciate it. Um, well, are you okay for us to put uh, the recording up? Obviously, I'll share it with everyone that's that's joined the session. But could we also could I also share the slides? Oh, of course. In an email. Yes, I will send them over to you as a PDF. I, I was just thinking about those ones with the red headings that people might yes. want to have a look at. Exactly. Yes, I had assumed that they would be shared. So that is, as I say, a little bit more detail if you you know um, want to read a bit more about holiday pay, a bit of insomnia. You want to. <laughs> read the guidance in some more detail um there is as i say even more detailed guidance both on our website and um on a variety of other uh, you can get access in another of a number of other locations i would suggest if you do need to deal with holiday pay that you do um either contact someone like us or, or have a good old read because it is very complicated fantastic now um just for anyone who hasn't worked with brochures before um they're, they're actually in the same building as us we're on Waffling Street <laughs> yeah, um, yeah that's so, right we um, can probably shout and you can hear yeah. us <laughs> so um local local law firm if you ever have any um questions I will put the links in an email that I'll circulate to all of you so that you um have a way of contacting Catherine and her team uh, should you have any further further questions but for now I think we can probably log off uh, thank you very much to everyone joining us today um, and Julie, if you want to stay on, you can have a, a quick chat with Catherine.
Okay, thank, thank you very much to everyone. And if I can just finally add to say, if you do want to follow us on LinkedIn, you will um, you will see the updates that we put up. We run a monthly free um, webinar session, so a short bite-sized webinar session, and um, which is normally the third Thursday um, of every month um, on a, sh a short uh, um, employment law or HR issue. So feel free to join if you would like to. Brilliant. Thank you. Nice oh, to see everyone. You just had another thank you. Thank you from Lucy oh, Barton. Thank you, Lucy. Thank you for coming along. <laughs>